And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tony McSherry. He's an existential analytical psychotherapist working in the NHS and private practice in Liverpool. He recently completed his PhD on the therapeutic in mental health nursing at the University of Rockhampton. And his talk today is on the private, private life of meanings, some implications of psychotherapy and psychotherapeutic research. Welcome, Tony. Can you hear me now, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thanks, Archer. Um, <clears throat> um, this is a reflection, really, on reading the paper and also reading the um, people who kind of, uh, the kind of critique of the paper. And as we were, as I was listening and, you know, as the mornings progressed, I have thought, um, it's funny, to get that bloody paper published, it had to go through two reviewers, yeah? And they just bend it and twist it. And in the end, in the end, you just give up and you say, what people are looking for is a, clar is a real clarified idea, yeah? Uh, that makes sense. And in the end, I just kind of gave up. Well, yeah, well, something makes sense here, so I'll just leave it at that, you know? But in, in actual fact, nothing really makes sense. So, um, so this is a kind of, a, this is a reflection on that paper, but it's just, um, it has some relevance to the paper. Um, <clears throat> so I'll try and go through this quickly because I'm not sure if I'll get through it in 15 minutes, but I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah. So near, near the beginning of the Kung Fu film, Enter the Dragon, 1973, the master asks Bruce Lee, what is the highest technique he hopes to achieve? And Bruce Lee answers, to have no technique, not thinking yet not dreaming. Something about this answer speaks to me of the practice of psychotherapy. Without excluding decis decisiveness or dreaming, we neither think too decis decisively nor dream too dreamily. Can such a strange practice be researched through method, even scientific method? I think it can be, <clears throat> but only if we cut out its vital organs and serve them dead on a plate. In the outcomes of the research, we are given something that bears no relation to the living, breathing sensuality of the psyche of the other. Something has been dissected and laid bare rather than being allowed to show itself. I may need the anatomist's kind of knowledge if I have a heart murmur, but need some other kind of science if my heart is talking to me. How can we understand psychotherapy as a kind of science that slips through the nets of methods aimed at deriving acceptable evidence? So to start with, one way, one way of approaching it is isn't the experience of understanding not always one of a misunderstanding? The most dense psychological descriptions and explanations are always still psych or end in theory or rationalizations, or else at best something phenomenological like uh, what comes to mind, but that may be more about me than you. Um, Husserl and others. Um, help me give some value to what comes to mind. Rather than jumping in with the explanations first, but sometimes theory, method and findings impose themselves like a gestalt on us. Husserl phrased what comes to mind as something like trusting in the givenness of the subjective experience of truth. What is it that gives the sense of the experience of truth? Is that not what we're after in research, truth? What truth is there in being fond of Husserl and not Georgie so much, for example? Georgie's interest in Husserl's work was distorted by some desire, the need to be accepted by a scientific community of peers. But still at the center of an interest in something, there seems to be a sensual edge, a reason that can't be got to through reason. It has to reveal itself in its own way. But I liked Husserl too, because he seemed abandoned and academically homeless, out of a job and out of fashion. 
I imagined him lecturing to an empty theatre hall or in a room doing his books under the stark bulb. He reminded me a bit of my father and his hieroglyphs. I wanted to give him an audience at least of one. It didn't matter what he said, but he said some interesting things in what I could understand from his translators. In a pub once, my father said to me, across the dark shape of a pint of Guinness, that envy was terrible, very destructive. Bright-eyed and blind-eyed, I wasn't sure what he meant then, what experiences grounded his words. I didn't grasp how Husserl was looking for a universal ground of experience and therefore science until some time after I'd tried to understand him. His academic son Heidegger disappointed him badly and he took his betrayal to heart like a jilted lover might. He may never have recovered. Heidegger saw past him to another horizon while Husserl remained fixated on the things in the rock pools. In the reflections, the world also shimmered with images bending to some light. I didn't feel like a narcissus staring into the pools, but instead some room was made for others to show themselves. Husserl's doctoral student, Edith Stein, converted to Catholicism, died in Auschwitz and was ordained a saint. <clears throat> she did her doctorate on empathy. Husserl noted that all the difficulty with empathy dissolved when we think of it as self-alienation. Think about that. How on earth do we self-alienate? Try to alienate yourself, have a go at it. Is not all research about trying to understand the other? Is that not about empathy and therefore about self-alienation? Lacan might call him an obsessive, working for posterity rather than living. He has been criticized for underpinning the idea of presence, that there is some substance to us that meditates on itself from a place of stability. We cannot fault him for having this sense. It does seem to be true intuitively. It is only when a word or a look snags in our flesh or gives way beneath our feet like quicksand that there appears to be something else going on. Freud, Merleau-Ponty, Heidegger, Lacan and many others reach down into the quicksand to make some sense. But from where did they reach down? What is that bit of stable, while perhaps foundering ground that gave them purchase? It doesn't have to be a universal ground, as the theory of scientific method would have us believe. How do you respond when I say, I'm sorry I haven't been present to you? You must have some sense of what being present might mean, but it might not mean, mean be the same sense as mine. It might not make any sense at all. The question of method in research is maybe whether or not you believe you can be present to anyone. The more intensely you believe it, perhaps the more you cling to some ground and end up as a specialist in research method. What is presence? Are we like those flickering candles of consciousness always missing each other's light, throwing our shadows upon each other instead? There is a place for presence that can be felt when you are annihilated by the other. It can be felt when we say the word I in a sentence. Who is speaking when we say I? And what of our bodies? Husserl's work seems to be shy of the visceral, just as much as Heidegger's is shy of humour. Merleau-Ponty comes to the rescue here, and his friend Lacan goes wild. Imagine those five having a pint of Guinness together. Husserl, Stein, Merleau-Ponty, Heidegger, Lacan. What weird understandings would fall between the silences? Would there be any silences? If the master breaks the silence first, who would it be? The silence can sometimes seem not breakable, but more like a glutinous material that absorbs freedom into itself without a ripple of disturbance. Is that not what the term evidence base does in research? It silences something that we don't want to know about or are not even aware of. If beauty points towards some truth, then surely these five people and many others, all of us here, have had some access to beauty. Is that not what psycho psychotherapy or psychotherapy research is all about? 
and access to beauty? How could we develop, develop a research method, for example, to provide an evidence base for a psychotherapy that invoked beauty in the other but refused to understand the other? I saw in my own therapist a strange beauty when she intuitively refused to understand me, yet I wanted her to understand me. Therein perhaps lies an inbuilt ambiguity of presence, of being able to accept both meeting and missing each other at the same time. There is a deep loneliness about ambiguity that seems essential to being a person. In psychotherapy, then, it seems that to try to make ourselves clear is a mistake, but we are condemned to speak and condemned if we don't. But in speech, a certain quivering, flickering life comes through the voice and is recognized in a certain flickering consciousness that might, might not be in the visible spectrum. There's a certain violence to speaking that can be seen more easily when a meaning is pinned down into something concrete, what I call a given meaning. We run into something solid that will not give, a harsh measure, a line that cannot be crossed, a self-punishment, an exam grade required, a sum of money required. A meaning imposed or assumed can be just as harsh. There is no room for forgiveness. The certainty in all of us is surely rooted in a monstrous drive to authenticity, even the certainty of presence. A kind of, I know who you are and what must be done. We all fall into this, don't we? I see it in my neighbours eyeing my hedge. It makes me think that we are all frail creatures, if not vicious, cut through by fears, the storms of living, the need for money, recognition, love, a safe place to sleep, even by Hegel's desire for pure prestige. The need to be accepted by the authorities. I won't get a job or recognition unless I do research in this way or talk in that way. Even the great Heidegger was frail. I surmise that Edith Stein must have had a sensual relation to others in some way in order to be interested in empathy. The sensual could be the whole private world of meaning embodied that you feel in your fingertips when you fail to explain yourself. It too alienates us from others just as much as something given. It is the living edge to a piece of burning paper. It is the way we might imagine a loving relation to a child. It must be worth reaching for. It might easily bend around on a Mobius strip and become a given. But think of the words loving, relation and child. What on earth do they mean if we want to give them meanings that we can all understand? What is a child? Someone loved especially or a nemesis? Husserl notes that meanings solidify and that the meaning of science has solidified. Perhaps it is not noticing this that is the problem. The phrase evidence-based has now, in our world of therapies, solidified into something as deadened to the other as a repossession note. A certain interest remains for those interested in the profit of evidence. The authentic, financially driven, rationalized appeal to evidence closes down on the discoveries of thinking freely. Not thinking yet not dreaming is forfeited to technique. Lacan says that the sadist isolates what is most precious to another. How sadistic it must be then to want to define so much with a meticulous attention to evidence in mind to abandon thinking to receive recognition. Perhaps the more authentic we think we are, the more present we think we are to someone, the closer we come to solidification or fixation of meaning, a given. The closer we come to trying to isolate presence, the closer we come to trying to isolate the sensual, pinning down the private life of meaning. We become Lacan's sadist, trying to isolate what the other values most. There seems to be a slippage of our very selves into the answers and the questions, 
a living bond formed with some idea that we don't know is there until it's too late. As Lacan would say, the analyst desire is not a pure desire. The empirical scientist in the field of psychotherapy is as much caught up in some desire as anyone else, <clears throat> despite at best the veiled appeal to being authentically objective, evidence masquerading as scientific authenticity, without recognition of the researcher's veiled appeal to method as authenticity, authentic science and some response, we slip into the sadistic natural attitude of our words, our research and our work. That's it. Uh, I'm not sure if I timed that right, but no, it's very time I read it too spot on. Was it spot on? Yeah, yeah. I was just about to warn you for about five minutes and you finished, yeah. Okay, so five minutes for questions. Yeah. Uh, there's five minutes for questions, if you're okay with that, yeah? Yeah, I am uh, fine, yeah. Well, thank you very much for uh, such a beautiful presentation to start with, yeah? And um, I personally was taken by a very kind of like poetic sound uh, to your presentation, the language kind of the private life with meanings they start taking their own lives yeah kind of like it was a very kind of like visual for me but yeah. anyway i'm just wondering if people want to comment thank you It's it's a it's a rather minor thing, um, but maybe. But I I couldn't couldn't hear who was at this drinking party, you know, round round the Guinness. So, wonder if you could say something about that. Who was at the drinking party? Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, in the in in what I read out, there was Edith Stein, Merlo Ponty, Martin Heidegger, and Jack Lacan. Right. Um, I think. Maybe someone else. And Husserl, yeah, Edmund Husserl. I'm not, not sure if he would drink Guinness. And in my imagination, probably me at, at some other table, listening in on the conversation. And probably my father as well. <laughs> I, I, I suppose something that struck me this morning as we we seek recognition from the authorities you know and i think i think that's a very powerful um that's a very powerful dynamic that goes on uh, I, I think it's probably it's probably driving evidence-based stuff you know um whoever's whoever's in charge of these programs um so I suppose it's important to figure out who our authorities are, or where we stand in relation to them. Maybe um, is, is that is that like seeking to fit in and to conform? Yeah, yeah, and, and how how to resist it? You know, it's it's so hard to say things without wanting to please other people in a way. You know, to to get recognition. You know, uh, like like to do research. You can't be, you can't get the recognition that you need. Um, you know, you can't get your PhD unless you kind of um, somehow fit in to what's required, you know? But maybe you can, I don't know, but uh, it's possible probably if you're Jack Derrida or somebody like that, you know? I, I, I'm reminded, Tony, of. Um uh, Kierkegaard's uh, writing about the Noah and and the Noah's relationship with knowledge right and uh, it, it, our relationship with knowledge says something about our relationships particularly with authority yeah um, and 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 there's that whole thing about you know it, it's not something we examine really very much yeah uh, how we re how we react and respond to to the authority of knowledge yeah 
I, just, I, I, it's interesting you say, because I, I, I think Lacan frames transference as the, the, the analyst is the one who's supposed to know. So the transference is actually towards knowledge, not towards the person, which is quite, quite an interesting take, really, on it, you know. Um, Tony. Yeah. Um, I, I think you've overlooked something quite fundamental in Bruce Lee's opening line, which actually touches on the rest of your talk. Yeah. Which is how much practice, which is self-practice, Bruce Lee had to put in to achieve what he achieved and to get to the point where he would say, I've, I'll throw it all away. Yeah. And there's a massive contrast between his self-practice and the way we indulge ourselves uh, by way of practicing on others. Yeah. You know, we take our learning and dump it on everybody else, as opposed to Bruce Lee actually had to go right through the, through the whole situation of it. It's, uh, it's something like, you know, so if, if we're going to be therapists, we, we need our, our own therapy, which, which BACP has chucked out of the window. Yeah. And it also touches, for me, it touches on um, what Manu was talking about, maybe bring that up in the plenary, which is this issue of, you know, his, his final line is actually, uh, uh, um, he's directing himself towards an imminence of, of presence. Yeah. And, and, you know, so it's all, it all becomes imminence and uh, affect, which is what Manu referred to right at the beginning of the talk. So it's um it's it's interesting what you've said, but I'd I'd be interested if you were to open it up to <laughs> to, to some more Bruce Lee as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just want to bring your attention, guys, that uh, we approach the end of this talk, and it's a ten minutes break now. Okay, thank you. So passed on to Dal. Well, thank you. Just to say, yeah, we just thought it'd be good to have lots of short breaks through, through the day and for us to start very promptly at 12 o'clock UK time. And uh, thank, thank, thanks, thank very much Sasha for the chairing and particularly Tony uh, for, for the wonderful presentation. <laughs>